Welcome to the SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this all this week, as always, is science <laughs> expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And also our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. I would like to ask you to a personal question that's become increasingly important in my life, hmm. which is, when does it stop being fun for me to be pedantic? <laughs> <laughs> Because we all have seen it. We're like, um, here's the here's the 93 reasons why this movie is wrong. And it's just like, no, 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 that's not good anymore. But there's mm-hmm. there's a place for it. How do I know when I'm being intolerable? Are you asking at what age you think you'll outgrow this or in no, the social context I'll never of like it. No. I need I need a boundary to stop me before I become one of those guys. I <sighs> see, I see. Okay, because my age where I outgrew it was like 18. As soon oh, as I switched no. from that high school to being in the you. real world. That sounds like it was a big win for, for you and everyone you know. Yeah, my social life. And yet life I'm out here skyrocket. analyzing the predator's face and thinking I, there's no way that those jaws could close because there's no, there's no, the musculature isn't there. <laughs> on his little outside teeth. Yeah, on the outside teeth. thin teeth. Mm-hmm. I think it's maybe more fun if instead of saying this couldn't work, maybe trying to explain how it could work. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd be like, here's where here's where there would need to be some flesh on the predator's face in order for those outside teeth to be able to do any real damage. Because I'm not yeah. saying, like, there could be little muscles in there that could sort of, like, hold things in place. If you don't know, the predator's got two sets of teeth. <laughs> he's got the out, big outside teeth and he's got little inside teeth. The idea, I think, is the big outside teeth would, like, fe- like hold on and then feed the prey into mm. the predator. But the real idea is that when he takes his mask off, he looks really scary to the people yeah, watching a movie. Yeah, it's good to have two sets of teeth if you yeah. want to be pretty upset. To double roar with. Yeah. Does he does he double roar? Uh, I think when he first takes his mask off, you're like, oh, this guy is not so scary. But then and Arnold Schwarzenegger's like, oh, I could take this guy. But then he's like, I have another mouth under my mouth. And then Arnold's <laughs> like, no way. <laughs> no way. The aliens have two mouths, too. They do. That is an yeah. interesting parallel. Yeah, which I think happens sometimes in nature. Like, aren't there some oh. animals that kind of have a oh. second set of teeth? There are animals with multiple rows of teeth. Like, sharks sure. have multiple rows of teeth. But I don't know if there's, like, a second jaw there's, within a There's some fish that have, like, a mouth that bites. And then inside of their throat, they have, like, grinders. Yeah, they got some more teeth it's down a, in sort there. Sort of an extra set of... Like doing mouth like work. You're right. Pharyngeal jaws in a more. Don't put your eel. hand down in there. No. Don't put your hand deep into an eel. <laughs> See, now it's fun because you're teaching us yeah. something. Right, right. And then there's that. I saw the tweet about this and it said, when the jaws open wide and there's more jaws inside, that's some more. <laughs> Which is my poem for the. No, it's not. <laughs> anyway, we're here on SciShow Tangents. It's a show where we get together to try to one up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for. For glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. But to start the episode out, after uh, you guys have made me feel a little bit better about myself, we're going to have a science poem this week from me. An important thing when life begins is to keep outside out and inside in. That's really almost the whole basis of a little thing we call homeostasis. There's a border between living and dead, between what you see and the eyes in your head. For you, it's about two square meters from the top of your head down to your feeders. The largest organ you have in your body. Yet if... <laughs> the largest organ you have in your body. Yet if I can see the whole thing, it's a little bit naughty. Keeping the outside in. Keep, keeping the outside out and the inside in. It's all eight pounds of your wonderful skin. <laughs> that was good because you gave no indication that you were about to do a silly rhyme like feeders. Feed, and up yeah. until then, it was so, it was so straight laced. <laughs> oh, I, was, I was having a problem, all right? Yeah. There's not a lot that rhymes with meters. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted, to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the sort of specifications sure. of our topic for the week, Important. which is skin. Sari, what is skin? It is an organ. It is a protective organ, and it has a lot of other stuff in it. But skin is only skin on vertebrate animals, which oh. I thought was interesting. Uh, So, like, biologically speaking, skin is skin and vertebrates, and it is not scales, it is not feathers, it's not hair. Okay. What? Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. But, But but like, birds have skin under their feathers. But birds have skin underneath, yeah. Yeah. Invertebrates either have 
like an arthropod exoskeleton sure. or mm. a shell, or if mm-hmm. you get to the gushy bits that are like a slug or a snail or a sea cucumber, that's just tissue. I don't think it's specialized enough to be considered skin, like a barrier. It's right. Just like is. a jellyfish doesn't really have skin. It's just like a... Just got goo. The tissue actually has to be different from the other tissue mm-hmm. in some yeah, way. Yeah, to be is considered it, So skin. one thing I, I know uh, from teaching anatomy and physiology once... <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm not very qualified to do that, <laughs> is that, um, th- so there's epithelial cells is like the kind of cell that we have in our skin. Mm-hmm. We also have it in non-skin places. We have it sort of on all the places that sort of experience the outside in some way. And so I'm curious, at the points where we transition from having like the keratinous, like the place where the epithelial cells uh, like leave behind dead, cur- like hard keratin <sighs> stuff that is the stuff that like makes up skin that's like hard and is harder to like cut through or scratch through versus like the inside of our lungs which do keep outside out and inside in like they're still doing that work or the inside of our digestive systems which our digestive systems are are covered in epithelial cells but like it's not really skin it's wet it's delicate you could easily scratch it and and have it bleed uh what it, it is basically i'm asking is my tongue covered in skin is my throat covered in skin? Is my rectum covered in skin? Is my colon covered in skin? It's got to be more like a slug, right? Your rectum and colon is a slug. And that's tissue? Is that right? That's Wait, what, what I would think. Not that it's a slug, but that it's like a separate <laughs> tissue. I'm so glad to hear that my rectum is not a slug. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a Your big rectum L is a hollow slug. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, which is basically a worm. No, I think it's because it, like your tongue is an organ and it's muscle tissue. In the way that mm-hmm. like your heart is muscle tissue or your intestine is, it is epithelial cells, but it's different than the yeah, epidermis. Well, it's, a, it's a muscle covered in epithelial cells, which yeah. is just like my calves too. Yeah, but there's other stuff. The composition of their epidermis is different than the composition of your yes. tongue in that it has yes. elastin and keratin and other uh-huh. proteins in it and glands. So sweat glands, sebaceous glands, like oil glands, um, hair follicles. And layers like that that you don't have present in other organs. And I think in, in the way that an organ is a collection of similar tissues, your skin has has those elements as a part of it. Right. I bet that there are some people who would argue that the, all of the whole digestive system is kind of skin. I, and that, I would I yeah. would love it. To what end, though, it. Hank? <laughs> <laughs> this is your new is butt legs is lip skin where does your yeah. skin stop and where does yeah. the rest of your is inside begin? skin, <laughs> skin. Yeah. so sari i feel like we got a fairly good idea of what skin is do you have anything else to tell me about it i do i have some some word origins because it's okay. kind of a mystery a linguist said the answer lies hidden in the depths of civilization. Uh, sure, sure. So <laughs> that, that sounds right for Classic. a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. as far Classic. as I can tell, there are two different words for like the covering of our body. Uh, mm-hmm. One category of them. So the the root word of cuticle and the root word of hide, like the hide mm-hmm. of an animal, mm-hmm. are the same, mm-hmm. uh, which is S K E U which means to cover or conceal. So it's like the mm. idea of this this coating that is concealing you and uh, is like your outer layer. Um, that makes sense in the way that we refer to like a cuticle, mostly like an insect cuticle or something like that. But the, the word dermis or like any sort of dermatology, dermal, epidermal, uh, mm-hmm. and the word skin both come from root words that mean to flay or tear or cut, Ooh. which is like a very violent right. origin like the and verb action. to skin. Yes, like the verb yeah. to skin. And I think that's because as we trace these words back, they kind of converge with the idea of like human skin is equivalent to non-human animal skin. And the way mm-hmm. that we process that was to like, cut it and flay it and turn it into clothing. And Mm -hmm. we just used the same word, even though we didn't cut and flay humans as often. I guess it did happen. Humans are violent to other (laughs) humans. Much less frequently. But yeah, but we're like, oh, we're made of the the same stuff. exception to the rule. (laughs) So it's the stuff that tears. It's the stuff that can get split open. We we had a word for the thing that was useful and the the process of acquiring the thing that was useful. And then we're like, oh, I guess like we need a word for this. Now we'll use that one. The doctors need a word. Here you go, doctors. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then from there, I think once once we had the word for human skin, then skin was then extrapolated even further. So we had animals first, and then we were like, oh, we're an animal. We have an outer layer that can be flayed. Mm-hmm. And then we looked at pudding and we're like, oh, that's a skin. Or right. like, this yeah. fruit, <laughs> like, oh, that's got a skin too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> became any old any old soft covering. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Ew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now that we know what we're talking about, it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show. Today we're going to be playing Skin Truth or Fail. <laughs> Being self-conscious about your skin can feel like a very human experience, but actually other animals have to contend with the superficial issue of how their skin looks to potential mates and also to predators, and even to prey. The following are three stories of animal skin, but only one of them is true. Which one is it? It could be fact number one. Fish-scaled geckos use their large overlapping scales to gather and store future meals, luring unsuspecting insects with scents produced by their skin and trapping them with their scales until they scratch their meal out. (sighs) Mm -mm. Lovely. Or it could be fact number two. When trying to attract female bats, the male wrinkle-faced bat covers the bottom half of its face with a flap of white furry skin that they only take down when it comes time for copulation. Great. (laughs) But that could be fake. It could be fact number three. To ward off sharks or other predators, the octopus Granalodone pacifica, maybe, craft fake warts out of ocean debris (laughs) with the goal of making their skin seem infected and thus unappetizing so it could be fact number one geckos trapping their meals with their skin and scales fact number two ugly bats using a face mask of skin for mating or fact number three creative octopi making their skin warty for protection ugly bats they're probably okay yeah well i don't know why else are they hiding (laughs) they're just self-conscious they're like every protagonist of a ya novel of like i'm secretly i'm beautiful but i hide it right (laughs) behind my skin (laughs) yeah do you take the glasses off and it's like oh she was pretty the whole time Uh yeah Gosh, the gecko one. Is that what it is? A gecko of some sort? It's a gecko. That one seems like something that we absolutely would have made an episode of Sideshow about. <laughs> so That's I just a dangerous can't believe road that we... to go down. Why? Be, yeah. The, because we're all like, we frequently get Sideshow episodes from tangents. Well, yeah, but I, happens mm, all the time. We would have seen this guy. I would know about him, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a little guy who keeps snacks under his scales. Yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. A little, like a top pocket, but a, yeah. a bug scale. You just yeah. I would have seen this by now. So the octopus one, not to tip my hand too much. That one seems like it would really require an understanding of like disease, like what a, <laughs> what being sick means and stuff on the part of the octopus. I guess not really. It just it, it just on the part of the the shark. Like if it works, then the octopus is going to eventually maybe figure it out. But huh. the, the shark does need to be like ew, gross. I don't want that gross octopus. And I could see it being an extension of camouflage in some way. Like octopi, octopuses already change skin texture when they can, or cuttlefish do, I think. Some sort of cephalopod can change skin texture. And so I could see them also modifying that with like, I'm going to stick some sand on me, stick some rocks on me. And it works for some reason, but, and, and like the humans are extrapolating that it looks diseased Mm. rather than the octopus headed into it with Hmm. that mentality of like, don't let me go to school today. (laughs) Don't eat me, please. (laughs) I just don't think, I also don't think sharks are discerning enough eaters for that to matter, but Mm. I don't know. I don't know anything about sharks, but all that being said, I'm going to go with whatever the middle one was. <laughs> <laughs> the bats? Yeah, the bats. Yeah, the uh, bats with the masked uh, bats. That seems very not real also, but oh well, I've yeah. already decided. I don't like choosing the same thing as you, but I'm also leaning towards the bats because it feels like something unnecessary. There's so many uh, that things that feel like unnecessary mating rituals. Like, ah, I just have like a big green feather oh look at my large black wings and so all the dumb all of the dumbest things are sexual selection yeah (laughs) and so it'll be like oh he has a very good face flap and it stretches so big it covers so much of his head that means biological fitness maybe so 
I think it's that one. And bats have really fucked up faces anyway, so they probably, hey, you know. again, That's fair. you don't even get onto the bats. <laughs> These are wrinkle-faced bats, though, and if you Google them, you you will see uh, that if they're not traditionally attractive. <laughs> um, they're cute. Um, are they? No, <laughs> they're, they're like, horrible. <laughs> they look like the predator, but with only one mouth. <laughs> they're a living nightmare. Yeah. They are very sort of like Rorschach test of a face. Yeah. yeah, that's not what you want for your face, generally. No, I don't want it for my face, but I think it it reminds me of being cute in the way like a pug is cute, where it's like, oh, oh yeah. you feel a little bad for well, it. Yeah. No, there's too many ridges on this guy. Yeah, that fi- that's a face only uh, an echolocator could love. <laughs> um, and the fact, you guys, is true. Two winners. Doesn't happen often. Oh, maybe. Yeah, I can see his little today. flappy right here. You can see his little flappy. So, uh, wrinkle face bats live in forests in Mexico, Central America, Venezuela, and Trinidad and Tobago. But sightings of them are very rare. So, bat researchers were excited in 2018 when a pair of nature guides stumbled on a rare group of them. When the researchers went to watch them, they found that there were as many as 30 male bats perched in a group trying to attract a mate. But, oh, God, they're, they're lecking. Lecking also is a thing that when like males gather to like display to a small, smaller group of females, that's what you get so many weird situations <laughs> of display. Like it's always the weirdest displays are from lecking males. Anyway, what is especially weird is that they, while they were trying to grab a female bat's attention, the male bats would cover the bottom half of their face with a weird flap of skin covered in white fur, and then they'd chirp through the mask. The skin face mask would remain in place until they found a mate, at which point the bat would lower their mask until done. That's what it says. The female bats don't have the mask, and researchers aren't quite sure why the male wrinkled face bats have this mask. One theory is that it could be a way to signal females that they are ready for mating, or it could be a way to uh, trap olfactory secretions that will be released during mating. So just get all the secretions all jumbled up and held in there until it's time. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's been hard to find these bats again since the 2018 sighting, so it may be some time before we know for sure. So the the geckos was very is very weird. We we almost could have used this as the fact because it, I think it is significantly weirder. Like I just it was so weird that I don't know, maybe you wouldn't have guessed it. But there are fish scaled geckos. They are notable because they have very large scales that can reach uh, up to around 8% of the gecko's body length. And unlike other geckos whose scales lay flat against their bodies, these scales are super large and they're only partly attached to the body. And the scales are notable because one species has been observed jumping out of them when trying to escape predators. <laughs> Ew! <laughs> when a predator grabs the gecko, it can jump out of the skin holding its scales and escape, and then it will regenerate the scales and the skin. And I'll put up for our video viewers, put a picture of this up <laughs> if we can get one, because it is I'll find one. awful. It, they <laughs> so they look bad. like... Oh, it looks like a chicken. Like a yes. little chicken breast. Like yeah. a little chicken breast. Yep. Yeah, it just there looks like chicken a chicken breast. breast. <laughs> 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 so just horrifying, horrifying animals for they're this week's s- episode of Tangents. They're so cute when they have their skin on, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, whoops. <laughs> yeah, which is true. I mean, it's true for most things. When you lose your skin, That's you get true. a little less you cute. You're significantly mm-hmm. less cute, yeah, I suppose. So. <laughs> As for the octopuses, they, there are... There are warty octopuses, but this is uh, only notable. They have like really little ones because it's a, a way to differentiate between two very similar species of Pacific mm. Ocean octopuses. Nah. But no, no fake warts. Just <laughs> no, ward it. off the sharks. Sharks ain't doctors. They're not gonna know. They don't have any idea. All right, it's one to one. Oh, we're gonna take a short break, and then it will be time for the fact off. All right, everybody, it's time for the Fact Off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind, and after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit, with preference going to those who are giving me good topics for SciShows and TikToks. But to decide who goes first, we have a trivia question. Are you ready to answer it? 
Yes, yes. this is my favorite part of the whole show. <laughs> Sebaceous glands are small glands in mammal- mammalian skin that open up into a hair follicle. These openings also serve as a way for the body to release sebum, a mixture of fats and cellular debris that keeps our skin from losing too much water. These glands begin forming when we are developing as a fetus, coming after the formation of hair follicles and epidermal tissue. What is the earliest point in weeks of fetal development at which these sebaceous glands begin developing? Scott. Sam's over here multiplying nine by four. Yeah, I don't know that, first of all. <laughs> I have so little experience with babies and mm-hmm. pre feet pre babies. Uh, <laughs> um I'm gonna guess twenty two weeks. Okay, twenty two weeks. These usually get picked when the answer is shocking. So I'm gonna say like thirty two weeks. Oh. <laughs> oh, like really late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to go a little earlier. I thought you were going to no. go. <laughs> Sarah's going to run away with this one because it's uh, 13 to 16 weeks uh, hmm. of, uh, of fetal development. After we're born, we don't usually develop new glands. Instead, they just get bigger as we get older. Huh. So they're, they're in there ready to go. So we've got all of our sebaceous glands, which is wild because we... Get quite quite a bit larger. We got so big, yeah, but we just still we just still got a lot of holes. The same holes. Yeah, we did to holes. start. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> well, you know, we just have the one mouth, so at least there's that. Yeah. Okay. Phew. I'm hungry. I would like a pocket cookie right now. <laughs> I'm also really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you, Sarah? Do you have a fact that can make me not hungry anymore? Oh. Um... No, it'll, it may make you thirsty, so I'm ready okay. to go first. <laughs> All right. You want to go? Yeah. Straws and other kinds of drinking tubes are a marvelously convenient invention. Have soda in a cup that you want in your mouth? Suck it through a straw. Have water in a backpack that you want in your mouth? Suck it through a rubber tube. A straw. Yeah, yeah, Even sure. trees kind of have straws inside them. Their xylem extends from their roots to the leaves, and they create suction to help draw the water up. But humans aren't the only animals that have figured out the power of the straw. And in fact, Ooh. some lizards basically have a bunch of straws in their skin. The skin straw. thorny devil is one of these lizards, a super spiky ant-eating reptile that lives in the Australian desert. The morphologically weird things that we can see are the keratinous spikes all around its body, but those are covered in a watertight layer of skin called the Oberhauchen, which I think is great. German scientists got there first. Uh, (laughs) And a layer of small scales. And if you take a closer look, like with a microscope, beneath their scales, shaped from the skin cells of the Oberhauchen, there's a network of 5 to 150 micrometer wide grooves, all leading right to their parched little mouths. Uh, And so even without suction, water can sort of crawl its way along certain surfaces, like partway up a straw or along a paper towel. This is called capillary action and is because water molecules are pretty good at adhering to other surfaces and cohering to other water molecules. So when a thorny devil stands in some wet sand, the water travels through capillary action into those grooves in its skin and eventually to its mouth. And when researchers have plopped thorny devils in little puddles of water, they just sort of stand there and open and close their mouths because they're drinking with so little effort, uh, (laughs) like a beer can hat, but built into their body and the beer doesn't have to be in cans. They just got to stand there. And this so-called skin capillary system has been measured to contain water that amounts to around 3.19% of the thorny devil's body mass. And it works wow. no matter where the water hits their body, which is why these reptiles rub their bellies in dew-covered sand and flick it on their backs, not for a dust bath, but to prime their skin with water so that they can suck up even more thanks to the stickiness of water molecules. Uh, so it's not easy living in a dry, dry desert and conserving water, but apparently having skin straws is one way to do it. Uh, this That's awesome. They look great. Is there any... The, the thorns have nothing to do with this. No. Surprisingly, okay. they don't. They're, those are all just like, I think, intimidation factor, maybe yeah, yeah, something no, to do with works, eating works for sure. ants. Yeah, but it's all beneath beneath the thorns, beneath the scales. It's in their skin that this it's is happening. in the what skin. The mm-hmm. How does it get to their skin if it's beneath all their scales? I think there's gaps in the scales. Like they're not, they're not as uh, 
t- tossing them away as the fish scale gecko, but they're not like totally locked together like body armor because their pointiness keeps things away, probably. If I was going to be some kind of species from another planet, I think I might like to look like that. Just like a big guy who looks like that? Yeah, you'd be like just like walking around on two legs. That would like, be pretty cool. Just like super scaly and thorny. And also, if I want a beer, I just pour it on my back. <laughs> <laughs> you could sit in a big puddle of beer and drink it to your butt. <laughs> and it's just yeah. you sitting with your mouth opening and closing. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hanging out with my father and I'll put my hand in the beer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that was good. <gasps> All right. That was great. Sam, what do you got for me? Oftentimes, a luxury beach vacation will include a visit to the spa where your skin is pampered by things like seaweed wraps, pumice stones, lotions, little cucumbers on your eyes. I've never been to a spa, so this is just kind of what I guess it's like. Yeah. You ever been to a spa, anybody? Oh, no. Yeah, but I've never gotten any of that. Never got the cucumber eyes? Just a back rub. Well, anyway, there are some creatures (laughs) for whom every day seems like a luxury beach vacation, like dolphins, for example. And according to a May 2022 paper, they also may be treating themselves to the occasional spa day. A diver and dolphin researcher named Angela Ziltner has been observing dolphins in the wild for a long time. But when she was diving in the Red Sea, she noticed the dolphins there were doing something that she'd never seen before, rubbing and scratching themselves on coral. This isn't totally unheard of behavior in cetaceans, but dolphins are not observed doing it very often. And as Ziltner watched them more, she noticed that they weren't just scratching willy-nilly like a dog scratching its butt on the carpet or something. They were rubbing very specific areas of their body with very specific types of coral Hmm. so coral is super weird to me at least in that it looks like rocks but it ain't rocks and one of the least rock things that it does is excrete mucus and it does this for lots of reasons like to avoid drying out if it finds itself above water somehow or to block uv light or and this one's important as protection against outside pathogens and sediment and what is a dolphin if not a big weird sedimenty pathogen if you really think about it (laughs) So the researchers got really up close to dolphins rubbing themselves and noticed that as they rubbed, the coral started producing mucus that would end up smeared all over the dolphin. Uh, And they seemed to use two different types of coral to treat different types of skin. Brushy gorgonian coral for sensitive spots and a type of large ridged leather coral for harder areas like their foreheads and both types <laughs> produced mucus when rubbed so they took the coral back to the lab and found at least 10 compounds in them with antibacterial effects and 17 total compounds that are hypothesized to do things like balance a dolphin's skin microbiome hydrate their skin or improve the elasticity the researchers also observed these dolphins visiting the coral after waking up from a nap like they were waking up in the morning and going to go take a shower, but just at the coral. And they'd even line up and wait to use the coral and like wait their turn for it. So the next step in the research is figuring out if this is a natural impulse, like the aforementioned dog butt scratching, or if dolphins know that the coral contains some kind of medicinal thing and seek it out consciously. But I mean, either way, we can find Mm -hmm. yet more commonality with the animal kingdom and our mutual urge to hit the spa and treat ourselves. (laughs) Are the corals okay? I don't know. Sometimes it said that they got so excited, the dolphins, that they would like bite chunks off the coral and go like, woohoo. <laughs> I'd be like, oh my God, my head feels so good. Yeah. <laughs> that they like really would get amped when they were visiting yeah. this coral. So probably. You know, sometimes not. you get a, you get in the back rub and you just kind of like just let them, let, let them have it. Yeah. I suppose. <laughs> what do you mean? A, just punch them in the chest. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, that felt good. <laughs> Woo! I would guess you the grab coral. grab the oil and just sort of sling it around the room. I would guess the coral doesn't love it. I, I no, suppose. it seems like it might be a little. Well, it's it's pr- it's producing the mucus theoretically <laughs> yeah. to protect itself. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the dolphin is like, yes, more. This is Do what that I want. Thing. The good goo for me, please. Give me that goop. <laughs> this is one thing we should remember mm-hmm. that other animals will totally exploit nature if given the chance. Sure, we're bad, but so, but everybody would be. If uh-huh. you like let dogs <laughs> have as much power as we do, they'd that, wreck the whole thing. That would planet. be a really big disaster, sure. No doubt. <laughs> now, the second, to protect the corals if this is a problem, yeah. can we just put like some good lotion down there? Oh. <laughs> the now other thing I'm worried talking. about is if people are like like you know 
that it were like three like telephone messages away from the beauty industry being like dolphins yeah. have been using this since the dawn of time to soften <laughs> their supple foreheads yeah and now you too can have a soft dolphin forehead that's no good if only we just irritate coral industrially <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking that as I was reading it. Maybe we need to right. censor this episode so that the <laughs> secret is not. <laughs> but it's like, say, if anybody does this, you can come back here and know that we preemptively called them a bad person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I t- have to choose between our two facts, which are thorny devil with capillary skin action or dolphins having spa days. Everybody loves dolphins. Mm-hmm. You guys are tied right now, too. Everybody mm-hmm. loves mm-hmm. dolphins. Everybody loves coral. Everybody loves straws. <laughs> everybody no, loves everybody straws. hates straws. No, that's true. Everyone hates straws. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, but maybe that's a, maybe but it's that's an a eco-friendly straw. Favor. It's like, here's a new way to do straws. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to use a straw. You can just kill a lizard. What's just more fat? Oh, it's the lizard. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, like, there's been a number of times I've heard about dolphins, like, doing weird tool use yeah. now, and so I'm a little bit more used to it, whereas a lizard that can drink just by sort of, like, bellying up to a moist patch of sand and then making its mouth go funny, that's just funnier, and it's more surprising. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. Sam. Sarah is the that's winner fine. of this, today's episode of Side Show Tangents. I think your judgment is slipping. <laughs> <laughs> we'll All see right. With well, the that's Twitter an poll. extra Hank Buck to Sarah. No, <laughs> oh, you can't. Yes, you can't give Hank Bucks in anger. <laughs> All right, well, that means that it's time to ask the Science Couch, where we answer listener questions for our virtual couch of finally honed scientific minds. Vita Bjornen on Discord asks: Is the skin on different parts of your body different? Like big skin moisturizer wants us to believe. <laughs> my wife has an entire skincare routine, and I use the same soap for my head, face body and teeth not actually teeth (laughs) it's great news it is on dolphins at least we just learned huh yeah i got different forehead skin for sure on a Mm -hmm. dolphin uh yeah skin is different on different parts of the body uh and that's all i know it does vary across your body uh it's not just big skin moisturizer it's big anatomy and physiology Uh, (laughs) uh they want us to believe it too there are generally two types of skin but then of course there are subcategories but it's um there's like the thin skin that has a lot of like a variety of glands and hair follicles so like thin and hairy is how one (laughs) one source described it Um, and then the and then there's the rectum yeah, uh, well, <laughs> thick and hairless. There's the other, uh, which is like hands, feet, uh, face is kind of like thin, little, like mixture. I don't know, lips. Pretty, you say yeah. thick and hairless. It's pretty hairy. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, thick and hairless. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's like depends on what the skin is, what the skin's main purpose is. Like, is it for protection or is it? coming into contact with other surfaces like paw pads do or our hands and feet do. Mm, yeah, mm. paw pads. Right. Mm-hmm. And the different areas of our body have different like compositions of I mean you can look at like how fa- hair follicles differ across skin. Like that's the most visually striking difference in different mm-hmm. parts of our skin is the different kinds of hair follicles that grow. But when you look at the glandular level as well, um then there's quite a big difference. So like your hands and your soles of feet don't have any sort of glands except sweat glands. So they're really yep. good at getting sweaty, but mm-hmm. they can't really get oily. They can't really get hairy. They, they can't get smelly in the same way. Because mm, um, they don't make the sebaceous stuff. Yeah, they don't make the sebaceous, sebaceous stuff. And I don't think they have the the apocrine sweat glands, which are the the smelly ones that are in like right. armpits, uh, genital area, puberty places. Sari did kind of just say that feet can't get stinky. They can, (laughs) just differently. Yes, they just get differently. (laughs) They get stinky because all your sweat's there and then there's bacteria. It's not because the glands are... And skin cells. And skin cells, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The bacteria are making it sweaty as opposed to like the sweat being smelly in and of itself, I think. I think even, even in the apocrine, in the case of apocrine glands, it's mostly what you're, I think, mostly what you're spelling is the bacteria the byproducts of the bacteria consuming the the stuff that the apocrine glands make. Yeah. 
I think. So is it okay to use the same soap on your whole your oh, whole right. situation? Oh, yeah. I think that I think that there are small differences that probably matter a little bit. Um, and I definitely have been criticized for using body soap on my face, but I still do it. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on what you put your body through, and also like so much of. So much of skincare is advertising in some way, like companies trying to make us feel self-conscious about a thing to Mm -hmm. then fix that problem. That wasn't necessarily a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yes, there are different treatments for different parts of skin. And I like to default to medicine because that feels more concrete than like something Mm -hmm. subjective like Mm -hmm. acne in a non-medical sense, but like aloe vera, for example, has been used for centuries upon centuries of human care for like burned skin or dry skin because it's mucusy and we already produce mucus to help moisturize things. We produce oils and other things. So like adding that onto your skin helps fix a problem that you identify with either your environment or like some damage that you caused. Mm -hmm. So in that Mm -hmm. way, Skincare is a science, and so much of modern skincare is just like inundating people with products. And so, the people who are doing the real science work are everyone with their little spreadsheets of like, okay, what does this do to this kind of skin? Yeah, it's it's also very personal. Like different, like skin is very like individual people's skin is, is all very different. So, like the the kind of idea, the especially the idea that one person would say to another person, "You're doing it wrong," is I think uh, something to avoid because Mm -hmm. we are all all have our different situations. Um, And if it's working and it's not too expensive and it's and it's not a it's not like a clear placebo effect. I think that's fine. All right. Thank you for your question, Vita. If you want to ask your question to the Science Couch, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents. We tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week, or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on Discord. Thank you to at Organic Bypass, at How About That Jazz, and everybody <laughs> else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents to become a patron and get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. You can also watch us on YouTube at youtube.com slash SciShow Tangents if you like it that way. But whichever is great. Or both. Or both. <laughs> that might be a bit much. You can also leave us a review wherever you listen. That's very helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell, tell people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz, who edits a lot of these episodes, along with Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Paolo Garcia Prieto. Our editorial assistants are Deboki Chakravarti and Emma Douster. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Parasitic blowflies lay eggs that hatch into maggots that burrow into an animal's skin, Mm -hmm. causing an infestation called a fly strike. That's the real name for it. The stuff of nightmares. I, my friend of mine had one of these and she ta- she just loved to she loves to tell the story. It's her favorite thing. And I'm like, no one else likes this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is especially a problem for Merino sheep. So not just my friend Bethany, but also for Merino <laughs> sheep who uh, grow so much fluffy wool on their butts that poop and pee gets uh, crusted on and it attracts blowflies, causing nasty infestations and even death. Oh, no. So a common but controversial way that Australian shepherds have managed fly strike is by, I don't know how to pronounce this word, mulesing, M-U-L-E-S-I-N-G, cutting away crescent moon-shaped slices of skin off of sheep butts so that it grows back as scar tissue without hair follicles. Oh. These bare butts without poop stink are much less likely to be appealing to blowflies.
They cut their butts off? I hate that a lot. That's they really cut horrible. their butt hair off. There's got to be a better way, Australian <laughs> shepherds. There must be a better way. Oh, get them diapers. <laughs> <laughs>